Thank you. As I start, I'd like to give just a brief background. Five years ago, I met some really interesting people. I had spent my whole career in enterprise software, and I met people from MI5 and MI6, so people more like James Bond than I was. And what they knew how to do was both attack and defend at the nation state level. What they also knew is once somebody got inside, the damage and disruption that could be done. Now fast forward five years, and we now have a company worth $1.65 billion in value, and 3,000 customers, of which a quarter of those are in financial services. So I wanna share a little bit of the lessons that we've learned, and especially the practical applications of this technology around artificial intelligence. And as the title implies, there's a lot of it that's being good, used for good, and quite a bit being used by the bad guys as well. So we're here largely to talk about digital transformation. And recently, I was in the Dominican Republic, and I was speaking with the uh, CIO of uh, this, this particular bank, uh, and I was just having lunch with him and said, well, what are your biggest concerns? And he said, well, from a risk perspective, it's our digital transformation project. And I was a bit surprised to hear this because he had graduated with his PhD from Stanford. He um, had a, a very good career in technology across different banks. He had lived in Silicon Valley. And I said, so why, why are you afraid of the digital transformation risk? And he said, because it's not being run like a normal project inside the bank. It's not being driven by the technology group. The software is not being developed by the normal software development team. The security team, totally blind to what's going on. So we, we don't know what phase they're in, how we can secure it. And some of the project has artificial intelligence. And so they actually need to take copies of the data and be able to train the AI on it. And yet we don't know how well it's being secured. So that was a real eye-opener to me. A week later, I met with the chairman of one of Japan's largest banks. Same exact concern. So that was a real eye-opener for me that we have to start paying attention to how do you take these projects that very quickly, because of cloud, can be spun up, and how do we make sure that we're securing them because at the end of the day, if there's a breach, um, the media won't necessarily care when they write the article to say whether this was something that was you know, live customer data, a copy of the data. All they'll know is somehow that data got out onto the internet. Now let me give a couple quick examples. This was a US bank. They were updating their mobile application for their customers. And one of the things that happened was that the person who pushed the cloud instance out to feed the data to the mobile app, he made a, a simple human mistake. Wasn't malicious. He literally flipped the switch on a setting. And all of a sudden, data that was going between the bank and the customer, which used to go over an encrypted secure line, now was being exposed because it was going through an unsecure channel. Just human error, so good or evil. This person had good intentions, it was literally just a human error. In this next case, this will be harder to figure out if it's good or evil. This was in a European bank. It was in a data center. The data center was very secure. In fact, they had cart badge scanners, biometric fingerprint systems for everyone who had to get in and out of the data center. And all of a sudden, our artificial intelligence detected that there were very strange connections that were being made from the servers in this part of the data center. And no one else in the bank had ever connected to these. The other servers weren't doing anything unusual. So we contacted the bank, and it turns out upon investigation, the person who was responsible for racking and stacking servers in the bank's data center, every once in a while, he would take a server, instead of rack mounting it in the data center, he took it underneath the floorboards of the data center. And he built his own Bitcoin mining operation. 
using the bank's servers. This had gone undetected because, again, it was an inside job done from the inside. Now, malicious or non-malicious, he was stealing servers and it was slowing down the operations, therefore, of the bank. He just thought he could make some extra money on the side by running this illicit operation. Now, this example sounds very far-fetched and, and very strange. We then figured out that about a third of our clients had some a level of illicit Bitcoin mining operation going on inside their companies. Now, this does vary with the value of Bitcoin when the attacks surface and decrease. So there's challenges. We often hear about cyber attacks where it's all about the malware and polymorphic malware and everything coming from the outside, social media, phishing attacks. But the reality is the challenges can come from the inside as well as outside. And it's just hard for humans to keep up with all of this. There's so many people with access to these systems and the attacks can move very quickly. So what do we do about this? So we decided we could look to the principles of the human body for inspiration. If you think about the human body, we have skin, and that keeps us secure most of the time. But occasionally a bacteria or virus can get inside. Most importantly, our immune system has this very rapid and very precise response. So it understands when something unusual gets inside and when it starts to take any unusual action. So we decided, why not use artificial intelligence to learn what's normal inside every company? And we, we use it to really understand what I call the DNA of the company at a very granular level. We, in fact, look at all of the people, all of the data, and all of the technology connecting to that specific organization. We learn the pattern of life of every user and device and when anything does something different that it shouldn't be doing. Now what's been interesting about this is we initially thought this would be a great way to help companies combat cyber attacks, including insider threat, threats that somehow went from the outside into the inside. But we have all these other ways Customers have used the technology. This first one is one of my favorites, mergers and acquisitions. When you go to acquire another financial institution, or maybe one of your clients goes to acquire a company, your own company will know a lot about how your systems are configured. You'll have some visibility into them. You go to acquire a target asset, you do not have that visibility. Now, yes, during due diligence, people will ask a lot of questions, you'll have a lot of meetings, but at the end of the day, you won't be certain of what that target asset looks like. So we've had clients who actually drop in the artificial intelligence during due diligence and get 100% visibility into the data flows, the people, the connections, the cloud, everything they're using. And that can actually help. We've actually had some customers where they use some of that information to restructure the deal. But all of our customers who have used it this way definitely make different decisions about how to connect the systems after the acquisition. Now, another area we've had clients work with is actually a partnership we formed with AIG around cyber risk insurance. During cyber risk insurance, you usually have an annual meeting with the underwriter, and they're going to walk you through hundreds, if not that over a thousand questions. And most of it for cyber risk insurance is all about your systems and your data and what types of attacks you've been under, how you responded to them. Well, guess what? Artificial intelligence can see all of that. So rather than fill out forms, we actually feed AIG aggregated data so nothing confidential, and this is all at the customer's request. And AIG, with that aggregated scoring data, can actually give higher levels of coverage or reduce rates. We think this could be more broadly deployed even beyond just cyber risk insurance. Compliance is a great use case for this technology. We have customers in the banking industry where the, some of the regulations are changing. They're no longer just checklist regulations. One example of this is we have something in uh, New York State 
called DFS. And they meet quarterly with their regulator. And they actually bring up our artificial intelligence and use it as a way to visualize the changing risk landscape and how they're actually combating that risk or at least getting visibility and monitoring 24 by 7. This one, I tend to call it the VIP program. Executives are very much targets, and especially of things like email, phishing attacks, social engineering attacks, or impersonation. Let's say someone's trying to impersonate the CFO or the CEO. The AI can actually detect when those type of very sophisticated social engineering type attacks are underway, and they can prevent it from getting to your executives. This one's quite interesting. Uh, this one was actually brought to my attention uh, by uh, Citibank, and this was brought to my attention several years ago by them. And they said, you know, they were thinking about changing the whole way they looked at building management systems and even pro possibly how they dealt with and managed real estate. And that was because these new buildings have all these IoT devices in them, everything from HVAC systems to internet-connected coffee makers, you name it, LED lighting systems, about a third of the attacks we see are coming through some type of IoT device. And oftentimes, your traditional CIO or CISO may not be thinking of it because it's really just coming built in literally to the building. So what this means is we're definitely going to have to change our approach. Again, the human teams can't keep up. We're going to have to build these kind of self-defending systems. And by the way, all the attacks I just spoke of weren't using very advanced artificial intelligence. There were people's hands on the keyboards coming up with those attacks. But that's about to change. The next phase is going to be this whole area of artificial intelligence being used at the highest levels by the attacker. There's two types. One is called adversarial AI. Now, adversarial AI is usually by a group who just doesn't want to see AI get broadly deployed. Uh, what will happen is you'll have someone, we, we had this stir up a while ago when Elon Musk said we have to be concerned about AI and robotics, and it, it could take over the world, it could be bad for humanity, and you'll get a new type of attacker, kind of, they think of themselves as, as kind of, um, hacktivists, right? Hackers and activists coming together. And they're determined to show society that AI is bad. And they'll do this often by altering the training data that's being used to train the AI system. In fact, you might recall a sim attack like this happening on Microsoft with chatbots not long ago. I think we're going to see much broader attacks on these new AI systems. There's also the offensive AI, and this is where the, the bad guy starts using artificial intelligence. And the, the number one way we think they could use it is to actually use it once they're inside a network to learn, to learn what people do, how the systems operate, and make it very hard for detection. So we have an offensive AI lab where we actually come up with some of these attacks. We have 35 PhDs in artificial intelligence, and we're doing it to test the strength of our algorithms to defend against these AI attacks. If you follow this area of neural networks and artificial intelligence, there's an emerging area, and it's called GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. And what you do is you set up two competing neural networks. And the example I'm going to show you here is one where the end goal was to get the AI to generate photos of people who never existed. So let's see as we play forward. It starts kind of blurry. The one system is creating a bunch of data. And the other system saying, mm, I don't know if that really looks like a person or not. Give me more data. And they feed against each other until the quality starts getting better and better. And actually, some of these look quite good. Now, again, these aren't photos of people, and they didn't train off of photos of people. They were able to take data and figure out how to create what looked like what the AI thought people looked like. 
Now, how does this apply then to financial services and to cyber? We think there could be a whole new class of attack, and this is just one example. Normally, when attackers create a new AI attack, they have to train it on real data. So we'll sometimes see an attack emerge in a part of the world where maybe the security barriers are a bit lower. We see attacks in India quite often, um, sometimes in parts of Southeast Asia, and what they're trying to do is use that company's data as a training data set to make the attack stronger. So then when it gets into a bank with good security, it's already strength is quite high, so it's, it's able to be more silent, more sophisticated once it hits. So this is just an example where the attacker now could just set up in a lab two neural network machines at a relatively low cost and use it to train up the attack so by the time it gets onto a bank in Latin America, a bank in Europe or in the US, the attack would be very hard to detect and could do a lot of disruption or a lot of damage. I guess the point being, this is turning into a flat out arms race and where the battlefield used to be nation states or governments just fighting against each other, the attackers have now moved into private sector companies. And financial services is a very good target for them. This will become a full-on arms race. And we're going to have to use this type of artificial intelligence to enable every piece of technology deployed in your bank to fight back in real time. In fact, every three seconds somewhere in the world, Darktrace's AI is stopping an attack or a threat from doing disruption to business or real damage. Thank you very much.